Hello. I'm Jennifer and I work here. Um, welcome. Well, I'm sorry, I just immediately got distracted by your shirt. Everyone can't see this, but it says adopt a clitoris. Um, <laughs> That really threw me um, in a joyful way. Um, so welcome to the green space. How many of you have never been here before? Whoa. So you guys just go to clit themed events? That's like, OK, cool. Um, how, how many of you have never been to a clit centered event before? Oh, OK, similar numbers. All right, so the green space and clits, both really great, often unknown. Um, we've established that, so now we can move on. Um, <laughs> Well, the Green Space is part of New York Public Radio, so maybe you do know WQXR or WNYC or WNYC Studios. Yeah, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, we are listener-supported, independent journalism, art, culture, all the things. Any members in the house? There was just a pledge drive. Whoa, oh my God, this is the best audience ever. Um, thank you, everything we do um, happens because of you. It is our biggest source of funding for what we do, is just everybody's donations, so that's really wonderful. Um, the only unfun thing we're going to do is silence our phones, so if you haven't already done that, let's get that out of the way. Um, tonight we're going to have a, a great show for you. It's going to be about an hour long. The bar will be open after, as will the waffles, so if you didn't get a waffle yet, you can still get on that. Um, time to chit chat. There's going to be trivia, there's going to be some videos, there's going to be a lot to learn, a lot to laugh at, a lot to share. Did you get your paddles and your markers? You did? Okay, so you're all ready to go. It's going to be really great. So let, let's get on with it, right? So your host tonight, Rachel Gross, an award-winning science journalist. If you haven't heard of her book, Vagina Obscura, now you have, you should read it. Sophia Wallace is an artist best known for establishing an iconography of the clitoridian, um, which you saw, Sophia's art is what you saw on your way in. And hopefully if you hadn't had a chance to really interact with it, you will interact with it on the way out. So I'm gonna turn it over to them. They are dedicated to bringing conversations around sexual health and pleasure to the masses. You are the lucky masses tonight. Please give them a huge warm welcome. Good. Welcome, Clitorati. Thank you for making it. So happy you're spending tonight with us. Such a beautiful audience. I was not expecting to see like so many faces. So thank you, everyone who's here. Thank you for coming out um, and being here to celebrate my favorite topic and um, I think many other people's in the room. Um, we were really excited to have this event. Uh, Rachel is an incredible writer and she focuses on science journalism. I'm in the art space, um, but when I came across her work originally, it just completely gave me hope that maybe we would start to be able to break through in these conversations. Um, having worked on the clitoris for about 12 years now, um, I feel like I keep having the same exact conversation over and over again. Uh, with Rachel's work, finally, there's starting to be some change. And uh, one thing that was really excited about, exciting for us about having this space was that instead of just answering like th the three basic 101 clit things that we always do everywhere, we got to really like level up the discourse and make it more fun and uh, center what we want to talk about. Um, so you guys are the first people that we ever get to share this with. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah. This has been a dream for me. Um, usually I'm behind a computer just going like this. And as Sophia was saying, uh, in my work as a sexual reproductive health journalist and writing my book, Vagina Obscura, I constantly came across these maddening facts about how little science and medicine knows or cares about the clitoris and how so many people with clitorises don't kind of know what their own body looks and feels like. And Early in my research, I came across Sophia's work, and I was like, oh, this is the person making people more clitorate and giving us these really gorgeous <laughs> representations that make you feel differently about your body. And I think that's part of what I've found so powerful talking about these issues is that you can really change how people relate to their own bodies and how they think about their sexuality by giving them visual representation. Even though I will pretend not to know any of that when we debate and I pretend to be science. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this is very special and uh, going to be a little silly and beautiful and fun. So, yeah, and 
We decided to prepare you for our very serious debate. We first needed to get everyone up to speed on the story of the clitoris, which does have some tragedy um, in it, and some villains, actually. A number of villains. Um, <coughs> Freud. So, <laughs> we were going to give you a little tour through visual culture and through how science has treated this part of the body to start out. Forgetting anything? No. Great. Let's do it. So I'm going to begin with visual culture. <laughs> um, I had a more on-the-nose slide, and I was like, they cannot read what this image says. I don't need to tell them. So we know this form. This form is everywhere. The obelisk is celebrated from national monuments to cemeteries. It is everywhere. We have, you know, the little scribbles on desks that little kids do, and every possible joke. This is a very known form. Um, and in this case, it's not considered obscene, and it can be in public space. And I think that's important to acknowledge, um, because when it flips to the other side of this symbolic system, which is the unknown clitoridian, uh, there's a different set of rules that govern it. Uh, as we can see, also, it's not like I'm just saying this is a, you know, this is a connection. Like other people see this. You don't have to be an art historian to be like, I kind of see a certain representation here. Um, and this form continues in culture in various ways. Um, again, I mean, so oh, let's play the, the first video. All right, boys, time for the ultimate dare. I dare you to skate towards the Krusty Burger and back naked. I'm naked. What face? A girl might see my doodle. Oh, I see. Then I hereby it's declare you chicken for life. Every morning you'll wake up to good morning, chicken. At your wedding, I'll say... Thank you. So, oh, when you're lunching, oops, we're gonna go back to. Oh, let's see if I can go. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, Ricardo, I'm you're all bouncing around. Right? Yeah. So you know, this is what we got. It's huge. It's glorious. It's national pride. Um, it's medically protected. It's vigorously researched, and it's fully insured. Um, and then the other side of this, this false construct is, is vulgar, is sy a synonym for weak, um, is, is only for utility, it's not aesthetic, supposedly. And it's not valued for itself, but rather for its labor, what it can do for you. Does it give you pleasure or does it reproduce? And that's pretty much its only value, supposedly. Um, in the art world, this idea is perpetuated. Um, little Jeff Koons, little Jamie McCarthy, um, and just to say, you know, not all phallic art is, is like depressing. Like I love Keith Haring's work and I love to see, you know, when dicks are obsessed with other dicks, like just call it what it is. It's like dicksteria, dicks in love with each other. It's great. Ride the dicks together. It's all good. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. We're just saying that, you know, there's more to the equation than just that part. Um, because when we get represented, unfortunately, uh, we get, again, the same trope. So this is uh, artwork by Anish Kapoor that's in Australia, and it's called, like, The Queen's Vagina. And it's just this massive, cavernous, almost like a horn. Um, and if you think of, like, you know, how masculine people um, who identify as male would feel if their genitals were represented as, like, 
this huge gaping butthole that was just open and waiting and you know just always in the position of like eye line of if you're walking around you just see this open butthole like they might feel a little bit like why are you representing us this way this is kind of shady um, but nevertheless this is the construct and we see this form repeated over and over again also in like feminist work it's not just uh, old art historical um, references like this. It's also, this is um, a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, and he's an incredible artist, an incredible anatomist. But when I look at this, I don't see beauty. I see, um, I see disgust, and I also see looking away because um, I, I don't know about you, but I've just never seen a big, open, gaping, vaginal <laughs> void with like wind blowing through it. And yet there's so many representations where you see this hole. And I'm like, where is that hole? I mean, I, I've never seen that. Um, or you have this representation, which is like the smooth, pristine, couldn't give birth, um, you know, a child's. Um, and it is disturbingly infantilized. Um, and then we have th this trope continues even if with feminist art. So this is a a very famous feminist work, um, but I would argue this trope is still operating because here is this very comfortable position where the vagina is huge and open and everyone gets the utility, they get to go inside. It's an anonymous person, we don't know who she is, she doesn't really have subjectivity, but like we get to enter her and go out and get something from her. Um, the clitoris in representation, uh, you know, it's either the diminutive tiny Haha, ha, so small, or it's like the mysterious enigma that you can't find. Let's talk about vaginas. Um, these, as many of you know, because you're my friends, uh, these are literal vaginas. So vagina is a Latin word that means sword holder. So these, my friends, are vaginas. And there's no escape from them, guys. There's no getting away. Because everything is named vagina to this day, there's vagina Bible, there's the vagina museum, there's vagina monologues, vagina book, vagina medieval vaginas, V is for vagina, you know, on and on and on. And none of these books that I'm talking about and so many others, many of which are, uh, you know, feminists and activists in their, in their purpose, are only referring to that opening, to that space. Um, so unfortunately, this void continues to define and shape the entirety of um, sexuality of, with people that have vulvas and vaginas, um, even though it means sword holder and it is just the actual tube, which, which Rachel will get into in much more detail than me. Um, what do actual vaginas look like? And can we also play this video, please? What are the limits of representation? Inside the female sexed body, space exists only as a possibility. Not present or visible, it is made as a response. A potential space is an anatomical term that describes the in-betweens inside of the body where tissues are normally pressed against each other, touching but not attached. How can a female sex be represented if its main ability exists inside of the body, outside of the borders of sight? How to illustrate something that isn't suited to a medium without it becoming lost in translation, reduced to a hint, abstracted, or fictionalized? To exist within the borders of representation, the female body loses its ability to make space. It becomes space, caught in the mechanisms of metaphor. Thank you. Can I just press play to go to the next slide this time? Just curious. Okay, perfect. So uh, my argument is, you know, culture is something that's created, but the beautiful thing about that is that all of us 
are making it all the time and can change it and can shape it. And so while things are very grim in certain ways in terms of uh, the status of the clitoris, uh, in other ways there's just absolute potential for us to reinvent, reimagine, and um, give the clit a whole new sense of life and self and embodiment and future that's like so bright and beautiful and totally different than what it's been. Um, so what I'm going to ask you all to do is look through the perspective of the clitoris and um, to reposition your point of view um, from the phallocentric subjectivity that we've all been educated with into um, the subject position of the clit where everything is, you know, refracting that phallocentric gaze and you are suddenly um, in that position. Uh, I think I might have been going too far, so I think it's might be your part now. Are we? Yeah. I think. Okay. I literally have goosebumps. <laughs> I'm just like remembering the first time that I came across your work and how it resonated so much and we have so much in common. Um, so back to the phallocentric viewpoint over here. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how science and medicine have seen the clitoris and the female body, um, by which, in this case, I mean bodies that have vulvas, vaginas, ovaries, uteruses, and clitorises. Um, and honestly, a lot of the themes that Sophia's talking about is what I was finding in my book. I was finding that science and medicine has largely focused on the female body as a walking womb, a baby machine, and as a vehicle for male pleasure. Um, and one of the examples that I like to use is the NIH. So a lot of people might know in 1993, uh, after the AIDS crisis and the women's health movement, um, Congress finally said that for clinical trials, you need to include women and people of color. You can no longer use just white men. And that was great. Um, <laughs> Well, it actually wasn't until 2014, less than 10 years ago, that the NIH got a branch dedicated to the health of vulvas and vaginas in their own right. Before that, it was all fertility and infertility. So literally, we didn't care about the uterus if it didn't have a baby in it, is how one scientist put it for me. And unfortunately, we're still not there yet because that same branch is still part of the National Institute of Child Health and Development. <laughs> Uh, and I want to take us back on a tour of some of the men who tried to define our bodies in this way, what they got wrong, and how that lingers today. So I'm going to start with Hippocrates, um, not because he's the beginning of culture, but because he helped set the stage for Western medicine, which has become so dominant today. Um, and this is the guy who helped come up with the medical ethics vow, the Hippocratic Oath, um, that basically says, do no harm. Um, unfortunately, he helped do a lot of harm. Um, <laughs> so he was part of this framework. <laughs> yes, he is credited with saying, the womb is the origin of all diseases. And he explicated on the idea of hysteria, or um, it's womb strangulation, and it's the idea that the uterus wanders around your body like a little beast in search of sex and motherhood. <laughs> and if it doesn't get it, then it punishes you by making you choke, faint, or spasm because you didn't fulfill your role as a wife and mother, and now you must suffer. So he was part of that. Mind you, this guy never treated women, never dissected a woman. Um, he said, I know all I know because midwives have taught me. Um, and yet, he decided he was the person to name our genitals. Um, so Hippocrates came up with a name, pardon my ancient Greek, um, to Adoan, it means the shame parts. And he named the genitals of men and women. Um, what's weird is that as my research went on, that name stuck only to women. So today in textbooks, you see this word pudendum, which means the part for which you should be ashamed in Latin, and it's a synonym for the vulva. And then you have in German, Schamlippen, which means the shame lips, and it's the labia. And then you have another one in Swedish that I really don't want to butcher, 
but it's the same thing. Um, in the 1500s, you have an anatomist, a French anatomist, dissect a clitoris, and he's like, this is definitely for urination. I will name it Membre en toe, the shame member. So this pattern repeats and again and again, and I was beginning to see the way that this idea of shame and stigma and silencing was kind of baked into the study of sexuality. Um, now I must address our friend, this mole. Um, so right after Hippocrates, a guy named Galen came along who would have influence for centuries. And he had a metaphor that the genitals of women were like the eyes of a mole. They were kind of interior and imperfect shadow versions of the correctly working organs. And he set up this framework in which the male body was ideal and perfect and standard. And the female body was just a kind of bad sketch, like uh, an inferior variation. Um, and in this framework, the uterus and vagina were an inside out penis. And I want you to hold that image in your head because it's gonna come up again. Um, and the ovaries were internal testicles to the point where the ovaries didn't have a name until the 1600s, they were just called female testicles. So fast forwarding to the 1500s, anatomy gets a huge makeover and all the scientists are saying, we're not gonna listen to those old Greek guys who just sat around and thought and never actually looked at bodies. Um, we're gonna go back to the drawing board, we're gonna use human bodies as the text um, and we're going to use what we can see because that's what we can be sure of. Um, and it was, it was kind of like a, a new era of scientific colonialism where the body was the territory on which you're gonna plant your flag, put your names. Actually, one of these guys, Fallopio, is the one who named our fallopian tubes. Um, and he also named the vagina, which as Sophia pointed out, means sheath or sword holder as if its only purpose is to house a penis. So again, the perspective is what can the female body do for me? Can it produce a baby? Can it give me pleasure? If not, I don't want to hear about it. Um, the leader of this effort to reinvent anatomy was this dude, Vesalius, and he was a very good scientist. He corrected a lot of the myths that the old guys had created, um, but he had a very specific blind spot. This was Vesalius's drawing of a uterus. <laughs> so this was very interesting to me. As you can see, it, it looks like an interior penis. Um, so something scientists told me again and again when I was reporting was that you can't see, you can't imagine, bleh, sorry. You see what you expect to see and you can't see what you can't imagine. And to me, anatomy is like one of these subjects that like the body hasn't changed much in 2000 years. Like you're not reinventing the wheel here. You're just like looking at organs. Maybe you find a new one occasionally, but <laughs> like he literally looked at the same body that all doctors look at today and saw something completely different because of the lens. He did not have the click glasses. That would have really changed things for the better. <laughs> they really would have helped with history. Um, and so his blind spot was the female body. And one thing he did not see was the clitoris. Um, so his, his students, his colleagues said, hey, there's actually something here in the vulva. It seems to be an important organ. No one's really described it. And he was like, no way. I have never seen a phallus in any healthy woman. And he joked that it was this new and useless part that had been made up for the glory of others. And it was actually his former student who claimed to have discovered the clitoris and wanted to name it Amor Veneris, the sweetness of Venus. And he said, this is a sensual organ in pleasure. And I have discovered it and anyone who says otherwise is plagiarizing. This guy's name was Columbo. I cannot make this up. <laughs> uh, after he made that argument, he promptly died and then Fallopio came back up and he was like, no, I discovered the clitoris, that was me. So. The cat fights ensued, but I guess the important thing was that now men cared about the clitoris when there was something to be gained, and that finally it was being centered as this locus of pleasure. And obviously everyone with clitorises in the background here is rolling their eyes and maybe crying. Um, but this is a good direction, good for the clit. The clit is getting some attention. People want to explore it. People acknowledge it exists. The bar is real low. So <laughs> this is actually, um, a really important midwife named Jane Sharp from the 1800s, she said the clitoris is a phallus and it becomes erect and it swells when the spirits come into it. And without it, 
Women would have no delight and no desire for intercourse, and she knew what she was talking about. But unfortunately, midwives did not, they eventually were kind of absorbed by the medical profession as it started to gain power. And so her words did not stay in mainstream history the way that some of these guys did. Um, another one, George Cobalt, an anatomist in Germany in the 1800s, made these beautiful drawings that look like landscapes to me, where the squiggly parts are actually the bulbs of the clitoris, which are erectile tissues exactly homologous to the erectile tissues in the penis. And he showed how expansive it was, that it encircled the vagina and urethra. Don't worry, we'll get some diagrams there in a minute. Um, and so he was saying that this is actually a much larger and more expansive organ than it's been given credit for. And again, we chose to forget or not acknowledge what he did. Way later, in the 1940s, there were sexologists in America who documented the vast variation in clitori clitorides, how do we say it? Clitorides. Clitorides, clitorides yes. <coughs> um, and that like this was an incredibly varied organ that had a very important purpose. Uh, so really history could have gone a very different way. And then unfortunately, Freud happened. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm oversimplifying here. Bear with me. The rest of it's in the book. Um, there is some nuance, but uh, Freud has earned some angst from me. Um, so a little context. Freud was working in this weird time in the interwar period in Europe when it was really important that women perform their patriotic duty and give birth to a lot of children to make up for the lost generation in the war. And so enjoying penetrative intercourse was really important. And this was the time of masturbation panic, of panic over lesbianism, panic over any type of sex that felt good but didn't make babies. That was a problem. And into this mess, Freud came with an answer as to what proper female sexuality should look like. Yes. So let me remind you, Freud was not a doctor. He once studied the brains of crayfish, and then he decided to found psychoanalysis. <laughs> so again, big blind spot, no experience with women. Well, maybe one. And <laughs> God save her. <laughs> um, and so he said, OK, I have an idea of what's going on. You know, I feel like women have a lot more neuroses and hysteria maybe because the culture they're in is not made for them and is made to hold them down. Um, and so I think that their sexual development is more complicated than men. Uh, when they are born, they realize that their clitoris gives them joy and they know how to touch themselves and feel good. And then at some point they realize that they're missing something, that they are, in his words, a little creature without a penis. And they compare themselves to the other. And so at that point, they have to accept their role as a woman, which is a wife and mother. Um, and that means transferring their pleasure that they got from their clitoris, which is their phallus, their like clinging to the masculine role. They have to transfer their orgasm from their clitoris to their vagina, um, which, by the way, is biologically impossible, which I will get to. Just want to make that clear. This was bullshit. Um, but he convinced generations of it. And he said that women that had trouble making this switch, which was both physical and psychological, were the ones who conveniently needed psychoanalysis, which was very costly, and he could provide. And this makes me really angry to this day, because so many generations, so many millions and millions of women and people with clitorises were told that the way their bodies worked wasn't right, that they were broken somehow, when really it was the culture around them that was failing them. And honestly, it was science and medicine that were failing them, because this idea had uptake in so many different fields. And it, it caused ideas like sexual dysfunction, things that have caused immense shame and pain and suffering um, still to this day. So a concrete example, sorry for this pivot. Um, <laughs> so a concrete example, though, is that the masturbation panic I was talking about, the millions of women who felt like they had not achieved true womanhood and something was wrong with them. And also, a surgery began growing in popularity in the UK and then America that was essentially the amputation of the clitoris 
to prevent like nymphomania or masturbation. And this was considered like a medically acceptable thing. It traveled to America where it's very popular. And one of the biggest proponents was John Harvey Kellogg who invented cornflakes. He invented cornflakes. He was, um, he was a very religious doctor. He invented them to be so bland that you wouldn't want to have sex anymore. Um, <laughs> He thought illicit sex was society's most loathsome ulcer, and he recommended putting carbolic acid on the penis or the clitoris, and then if that didn't work, surgery. And I'm sorry, this is like really, really dark, but it was in response to this idea that the clitoris was a pathological um, and clearly an actual center of female pleasure. So there was acknowledgement in a horrible way. And like, you know, I'm... I'm going deep into history here, and it always feels like crazy to have written a science book and be talking about Freud and his wacko ideas. But what I've found in my reporting since is that these attitudes linger and they shape healthcare, and ultimately they shape our relationship with our bodies. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so a couple years ago, I wrote an article on endometriosis, which has been gaining a lot more attention understanding lately. It's a disease where tissue similar to that inside the uterus grows outside the uterus. And it's been called the new hysteria by scholars because the way it's often been treated is, okay, this is a reproductive disease and it's women have been told to just get pregnant to cure it um, until incredibly recently. Uh, which is very similar to that hysteria idea that Hippocrates was saying, that this is your punishment for not doing your duty. So mm -hmm. um, Linda Griffith is a bioengineer that I profiled for the New York Times, and her sh in her experience, she was told by a doctor in the 90s, I believe, that she was rejecting her femininity, and that is why she had pain in her uterus, and why every month she was on the floor throwing up in pain. Uh, and later she became a scientist and she taught from an endocrinology textbook in the 1990s that defined endometriosis as a disease of neurotic white women who pursued their careers and forewent having children. So fortunately she was in the position to actually study and demystify this disease and she just saw that these myths and this Freudian craziness had allowed us to disregard the true biology of female bodies in a way that we will never do to men's bodies. There was just like a lack of rigor in the way we studied it. And so she actually f was pushing the idea that this is a body-wide inflammatory disease. And you can't just cut off hormones or tamp down the reproductive system or tell someone to get pregnant. There's many other avenues that are much more promising if you acknowledge that this is not a reproductive system gone haywire. This is not an ancient punishment. So the next year, I wrote about that word I mentioned, pudendum. Um, that means the part for which you should be ashamed. And it, it turned out, after my book came out, they actually got rid of it in the academy. And there was this fierce debate in an anatomy, in the upper echelons of anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, progress, small progress. <laughs> Big progress. Um, unfortunately, it was a very heated debate. And the first suggestion they made was that we should just add male pudendum in so that it's equal and <laughs> spread the shame around. Um, no, they, they, they did get rid of it um, because there's a very obvious synonym, which is the vulva, which, by the way, just in case you need a refresher, is all the parts that you can see and touch, the fun bits, I call them, um, the outside, the parts that are mostly involved in sexuality. Um, but this idea stuck with me that the language we have matters, even if it seems like it's small, like it's technical, because shame and a lack of language, it shapes people's experience with healthcare. So um, this is a really good survey. It's a bit older, from 2014 in England, but of young women who took this survi survey, more than half were embarrassed to say words like vulva and vagina. Um, they use things like lady parts and women's bits, um, and one third of them didn't go to the OBGYN because they were embarrassed. They didn't want to say these words. Um, and one of the most horrifying things I learned recently when I wrote about the history of the word vulva was that doctors are also uncomfortable saying these words sometimes. So I met someone whose grandma didn't know what cancer she'd had because the doctor told her she just had downstairs cancer. What? Which is 
horrifying when it comes to medical communication, who has authority in this world, um, and just like what information you get about your own body. Um, and finally, I wrote an investigation on what doctors learn about the clitoris in med school and how much, if any, they pay attention to it with patients, especially gynecologists who are best known for treating female bodies. Um, and what I found is that most of them learn barely anything in medical school, except to avoid the clitoris, so as not to avoid the patient. So the most memorable thing I heard was that doctors told me that for gynecologists, the vulva is like a small Midwestern state. It's a flyover state. You <laughs> literally pass through it to get to your real destination, which is the cervix and the uterus, because what you care is about reproduction, um, contraception, or disease like cancer. And I went one step further to the delight of the internet and, <laughs> and to the horror of some, and said that if the vulva is a Midwestern state, then the clitoris is like a small local roadside bar that doctors pretty much want to avoid but I think you should visit because it has really good karaoke <laughs> Wednesdays. <laughs> Shout out to this real bar in Wisconsin. Um, and my point here is that the science has had a really bad track record, unbelievably bad and unusually bad when it comes to genitals and women's bodies. Like, it has not been as self-correcting as we expect science to be. It has really failed in a lot of ways, but I think that's why scientists need to come and fix this. And as we get new voices in science, as we get more women and queer people and people of color, they're the ones that are asking the questions that none of those older scientists asked about what is this body part for in regards to the person who has it? What is their lived experience? How are they experiencing pleasure? How are they doing more than just surviving and enduring and ex being expected to put up with pain. And we're finally getting a lot of exciting new information that I think is really energizing. Um, so for the next part of our, of our presentation, um, we're going to embody the muses of art and science, and we're going to see who deserves the honor of taking on the mantle of the clitoris and rescuing her from this history of obscurity and ridicule, and who can really make the most change going forward. So, and we invite you to join along. Um, you, can, you can boo if you really want, you can clap and cheer, and you can, you can yell points, just keep it civil, please. Um, but any input is, is much, appreciated Whoa, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah that is a good um foreshadowing of what is to come <laughs> why not both como no los dos that is a very good question person that i cannot see because the lights are in my eyes yes uh, so we're going to leave you with a video of what happened when we took sophia's art and made a makeshift clitoris shrine in washington square park yeah. please enjoy What drew you over here? Um, we tried to uh, support and attend all the big clitoris events in the area. I see you got the memo today, so we appreciate it. Is yeah. there anything that you that you wish you'd learned or that you wanted to know more about? I think a lot of sex ed is more geared toward like cis male biology. So I did kind of wish we learned that. And um, a lot more about like consent. I wish that we had learned more about that. I think that's also really important for sex ed. It wasn't really like, oh yeah, it's a beautiful thing. It was more like, don't do it. Otherwise you're gonna get an STD and you're gonna die. I wish I low-key spent a little bit more time paying attention in health class. There's actually more than 10,000 nerve fibers in the clitoris, which we learned three months ago. It's like kind of crazy that it was only three months ago. Well, one reason we're kind of talking about this is because female pleasure and the clitoris have been really understudied and undercared about by science and greater society. So we want to spread knowledge and like have conversations and find out what people want to know. I, I came from a really conservative, like Christian background growing up. Um, 
and then I was just in like sexless relationships for a long time until until I discovered all this stuff. So I hope that other women make this discovery and then can go on to have like wonderful, fun, pleasurable sex lives. You know, um, when I was Amber's age, yeah, there's no way you would have ever seen that, like at least not where I'm from. And uh, also we just only discovered like, you know, yeah, what, what because it was pretty much like okay yeah like rub it a bit but like sort of let, let the guy get on with it you know and I think it's great how much that has changed actually and yeah. it's so necessary what do you want the public to know about the clitoris that they get wrong um uh, that I mean her purpose is for pleasure like it is and she shouldn't be something that's scary she should be something that's worshipped and is beautiful do you know the word for labia in German no, I don't. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just happen to know that it's shamlipin, shame lips. What do you think about that? I, I, don't, I don't know if I like that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that is crazy. I'm definitely getting clit support vibes. Who, who amongst us hasn't felt like they had to like act a certain way or like look a certain way or like you're afraid that something that feels good is making you make a really weird face. Like there's so much stuff that makes it hard to talk about. It's just, um part of our beautiful body as a whole, to be respected and not abused with. Do you want to ask what it is? It's a clitoris. <laughs> Have a good day. Uh, how'd you guys like the video? Because <laughs> it's surprising. <laughs> Uh, also, we didn't mention it, but I really hope you got a chance to have a little thought or write a little note or think about the clit shrines outside. And if not, there'll be time later. Okay. But now we need to get really super serious. Um, Sophia, Muse of Art, would you like to start? Actually, I guess I can start. I think you're starting, but... I knew that. <laughs> I just needed my lab notes. <coughs> all right, all right. So I, science, believe that, listen, I'm not here to argue that scientists are saints or heroes or infallible. We know that scientists done some really terrible shit and I just showed you some of that because science is deeply part of the culture that we're in and it's just a subject to abuses of powers as our culture makes it. Um, however, there are many scientists who are as fed up with the status quo as we are and as you are. And again, they are asking new questions and for better or worse, Yay. Thank you, Ricardo. Do you see his shirt, you guys? Yeah. Ow! <laughs> we love. <laughs> And um, science, oh yeah. <laughs> For better or worse, our society deeply respects scientists and doctors. Yes, even in the Trump era. And doctors have major authority. And if we want to rehabilitate the clitoris and get the culture to truly change, we need buy-in. We need data, we need evidence, because that's what people will listen to and that's what can be used to change policy. Thank you. Oh. oh, sorry. <coughs> no. <laughs> Day. Sorry. Now I go. Oh. No, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I need a lab assistant up here. Oh, uh, there we go. Oh, okay. I think it's great that scientists are doing their research and. Um, giving us the truth and whatever, but 
The reality is that we are in a situation where the most sensitive part of half of the world's bodies and also half of mammals, a bunch of reptiles as well, snakes, um, half of their bodies, uh, the most sensitive part, the part that is the most capable of pleasure is invisibilized actively. So how is science going to address this? And if we can't see this part of ourselves represented anywhere, um, you know, the fact that science has known and then didn't know, and now it knows again, I don't feel like we're really getting where we need to go with science. Okay, okay, fair. These are our opening arguments. <laughs> cool. Back, okay. I, I give you that one, art. So <laughs> here's what science is doing about it. Evidence and data defines the scope of the problem. We need to have the numbers so that we can see what's wrong and so that we can make change. Here's an example. This is data from sex researcher Cher Height in 1976. She asked 3,000 American women aged 8 to 96 their experiences with sex and sexuality. She found that 95% of them could orgasm quickly, easily, within minutes. They knew their own body. Their body worked perfectly well. No one had to tell them what to do. And then, weirdly, enter a penis. Now, according to very different data from 2017, 18% of women are regularly orgasming in penetrative intercourse. Um, I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So it is not a contest. I do not want a bunch of comparison. But listen, hetero women, we're, they're not doing okay. Like, this is a D, not even a D plus. And this is, I want to be clear, this is not women failing. This is society failing women. And the way that Cher Height put this, I think, was really brilliant, was that this kind of data shows that the whole question is wrong. All of these surveys are asking, why are so few women having an orgasm from penetrative intercourse. I mean, this wand of pleasure should do its thing, right? No, the question should be, why do we expect women to orgasm from intercourse if we just look at the basic facts of their body? And the basic facts of the body are this. Here's the clitoris by the numbers. More than 10,000 nerve endings, more than 90% beneath the surface. It's an iceberg organ. 100% of orgasms rely on it, which I'll explain in a minute. Now. This all leads to only one conclusion, that the clitoris is the center of the female pleasure sex universe, and that clitoral stimulation is needed for good sex. And if anyone tries to tell you otherwise, first of all, ladies, dump him. <laughs> Second of all, we have the proof, we have the evidence. It is literally undeniable. Just ask me. Science. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Am I going? I don't feel like I'm going anywhere. <laughs> Give it a second. <laughs> Making my point. Needs a little lubrication. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, look. It's great we have data, but it's way too hierarchical. It's way too numeric. Um, there's this constant focus on quantifying things. A little kid knows where their clitoris is, knows that it feels really good when they stimulate it, many times knows how to have orgasms. We don't need to know that there are thousands of nerves there to know that is exactly where our pleasure is. Uh, so I don't know if I really feel compelled that we can trust science with all this data to actually um, just get back to the basic thing that a four-year-old child with a clitoris already knows about themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I completely agree with you, and I think you've really hit on a point that so much data that we have goes nowhere. It's either languishing in a scientific study or it's just basic science. Um, so data an alone is not enough. You are totally right. Um, however, there is some data that has been used for a very important purpose, which is to bust harmful myths and settle long-held cultural debates. 
And one of those is my personal bugaboo, the vaginal orgasm. Uh, so this is from 2015. Cosmopolitan is still telling us to have a vaginal orgasm. Unbelievable. Wrong. <laughs> Myth. <laughs> so actually, starting in the 50s and 60s, those sexologists I mentioned, they, they took a very objective view and they watched a lot of people having sex and they studied the body in all states of arousal and they defined orgasm. They said that it had four stages, arousal, excitement, um, orgasm and I always want to say denouement like it's a novel but I think it's like re resolution Refract refraction would be cooler so you know this is a bit simplified there's like much more variation we know now um, but what they said was that orgasm is this fundamental human experience that is actually very similar no matter what kind of body and what kind of materials you're working with um, it's this well this is very not romantic but um, it's this uh, like contractions muscle contractions um, extended nerve activity and blood flow and these contractions are usually once every 0.8 seconds and in the case of people with clitorises you can feel that orgasm anywhere you can feel it in the well not anywhere but usually the vagina the cervix the anus but it all goes back to the clitoris all orgasms are clitoral and they actually s said that the clitoris is an organ unlike anything in human anatomy in that its sole known function is pleasure and that Freud's idea of transferring your orgasm is biologically impossible. So that is a myth that science has busted. There's another myth um, about nerve endings. So you might have heard this phrase that the clitoris has 8,000 nerve endings, but still isn't as sensitive as a white man on the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> still true. <laughs> Spirit, true, substance needs little work. Um, and Basically, this myth was busted in the past year, which I guess says a lot, but there are Ooh. these, yes, two doctors who are featured in our shrine, Dr. Blair Peters, Dr. Maria Uloco, we thank you. And they are actually, so Blair is a gender affirmation surgeon in Oregon, and Maria is a vulva specialist. She runs a whole clinic on vulvas, which is super rare because of that focus on reproduction that's so prominent. And she's at UC San Diego. And they're real life besties, which we love. <laughs> yes. And they kept hearing this number go around in gynecology meetings with no source, no citation. Um, and like a lot of feminist texts, and like, I'll be real, I have said it as a journalist, this 8,000 number, because it just sounds impressive. Um, and you know, we all know how sensitive and powerful, like you said, a four-year-old knows. So it just seems like it makes sense. But they were like, this says something else. So they looked back, and the earliest they could find, like the where this number came from, was a 1970s study on cows. <laughs> and so to them, this showed this fundamental disregard, <laughs> and again, this lack of rigor when we talk and think about the female body, that no one thought to like fact check, confirm, or maybe study, I don't know, real human women. And it just so happened that because of what Blair does, he performs phalloplasties, which means you take a clitoris that's been enlarged by hormones and you refashion it into a phallus and you have to hook up the nerve. And so he was trimming a tiny bit of the nerve. Um, and so he would have this part of the body that no one else would have. And he was able to magnify it and stain it and count the nerves for the first time. And this is just cool. So I thought I'd show you um, with his permission. This is a slice of clitoral nerve under the microscope and those kind of craters or dark blue bundles are bundles of nerve fibers that you can individually count. Um, and what they found was the number was way bigger, 10,280. <laughs> um, and that's on both of the nerves. I should give a very brief lesson on the clitoris, I realize, so that you know what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, I have these beautiful models right here that I can use. Um, so the nerves actually run across the top so this part is the glands, this beautiful swan beak, and that's the part that we all know and love. It's only like less than 10% of the clitoris, but a very, very important and beloved 10%. <laughs> There's also a shaft. Yes, ladies, you have a shaft that goes back into the body, and you have these two beautiful arms of erectile tissue that flare back against the pubic bone, and these two bulbs that hug the vagina and the urethra that are also erectile, and they swell up 
and engorged with blood when you're aroused. And so the whole thing is made of erectile tissue, and it all comes from the same kind of basic body plan in the uterus that male genitals do. So we are much more alike than we are different, and there's a beautiful variation of clitori. Oh, and the nerves that we're talking about run along the glands and the shaft, um, and there are two of them, and they rock. <laughs> so here's what cows think of this. <laughs> And just speaking of other animals, I just did want to touch on how Sophia mentioned that snakes have clitorises. And again, we just found this out like this year. So every single mammal that scientists look at has had a clitoris. This is thanks to biologist Patty Brennan. I just want to give credit where credit is due. Um, but dolphins have a huge external clitoris. If you're going to be reincarnated, come back as a dolphin, <laughs> let me tell you. And they use it a lot. Snakes. <laughs> Snake clitorises have two prongs, which is super cool. Lemur clitorises have a clitoris bone called an os clitoris in it. And bonobos have maybe the best clitoris of all. It's, it's front facing and it extends two to three inches when aroused. And it's used mostly for female female mating to the extent that primatologists believe it evolved solely for female pleasure. And I think that just looking at the natural world tells us that you know, genitals aren't just for reproduction. Our bodies are not just, this is something Sophia and I talk about a lot, our bodies are not just for survival, reproduction, death. Like, they are literally made for pleasure, bonding, connection, relationships, communication. And your clitoris is part of that, and the fact that it's so widespread shows you that it's there for a purpose, I would say. Um, science. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to go back to art, though. I think that art is much better at holding complexity and multiple truths, um, understanding that pleasure and joy don't have to be proven in a lab to be real. And I think that we have a, a strong, uh, unfortunate uh, track record of science being blocked from actually being objective and seeing truths because of its bias. Science is too dependent on funding. And its obsession with measurement resulted in only seeing on what's on the surface. And this has been especially problematic for the poor, undervalued clitoris. Um, I th personally think that artists, because we work in the unknowns, we are particularly suited to talking about things that are unseen, things that society doesn't want to look at. Um, things that other disciplines are afraid to touch. And I will stop there for your, t your next, <laughs> sorry. Mm. <coughs> All right. Woo! <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think, like, as you'll see when you walk out of here, Sophia has created a Clitoridian world that couldn't be imagined without art, and that's something we need visionaries to give us, we need help to see what we can't yet imagine. Um, and I do want to say that scientists also have imaginations, contrary to popular belief. Oh, I got to stop taking these off. It's not helping. Okay. So let me just say that artists reframe the world for us. They help us see in new ways. But science at its best has done that too. So. Galileo helped us see that we were not the center of the galaxy, literally. We were one small part of something much, much larger. Darwin, for all his faults, helped us see that we are a part of nature and that we were not put here magically on Earth. We went through the same natural processes of evolution that all other living creatures on Earth did. He showed us that we are all connected. And I would like to introduce you tonight to one more visionary. Uh, her name is Dr. Helen O'Connell. Yes, you will know her name. <laughs> uh, she's out there in the clit shrine, and she is a good <laughs> friend to the clit, perhaps the anti-Freud, I would say. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about her story. She is the first female urologist uh, in all of Australia. And when she was coming up in med school in the 1980s, uh, she noticed something that kept bothering her. And it was that her textbooks were really bad at describing female sexual anatomy. They literally described parts of the female body as 
failures of male genital formation and as lacking rigor and support and lacking glands as if the female was just a lack. Um, and they also either, this is very common as we both have a beef with, they would either say the clitoris was just the glands, which again is less than 10%, or they would omit it entirely from cross sections like this. But bad, 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 why? Um, <coughs> so she described to me that she was like, I knew this wasn't true from my lived experience. I was recently married. I knew very well how my clitoris worked. And yet I was being told in these all male classes that my lived experience, my felt bodily experience wasn't true. And I knew that there had to be something out there. And she got to this feminist like health, sorry, this women's health center. And she started reading some feminist texts. And one was called A New View of a Women's Body. And it had this image um, by Suzanne Gage. And it was done not by doctors using imaging techniques, but by women who watched each other masturbate and watched each other in different stages of arousal and paid attention to their own bodies and drew what they felt and saw. So I admit this is definitely art. <laughs> yes, this is a point for both of us. Um, and it showed the clitoris as this substantial winged body and she'd never seen anything like it. And she thought to herself, like, I'm very data driven, but I also know what I feel and I know this is wrong. And I think that I can go kind of like Vesalius, like back to the body and find the answer. And she looked at more than 50 women who had passed away. She also looked at living women. She used micro dissection, she used MRI imaging. And ultimately what she found was this beautiful and complex shape. Um, the clitoris there is sitting upon the urethra and then the uterus. Um, I told you I'd give you a diagram. Um, and if it helps, the clitoris is sort of at a 45 degree angle. Um, so here's one of the educational models based on her work. I printed it at MIT using 3D printing, but it's kind of slanted like this. I don't know if that helps anyone, but it was an aha moment for me, like a year into my research. I was like, oh! Um, so what was beautiful was how she thought of it. She was like, this is actually a, a whole, this is a clitoral complex. It's an iceberg organ. And the way Freud was going about it was so wrong, trying to say that our body was made of these warring parts, these fragments that didn't go together. This is a unified whole. Our bodies know what they're doing. The clitoris interacts intimately with the vagina, the urethra, the cervix. It's all part of the same thing. So this idea that there was a vagina and a clitoris, no, it was all one unified system. And we were whole beings. Uh, and that really resonated. And so now there are educational models based on her work. And it, it was really the fact that she gathered the data that kind of convinced people to take this seriously and made it, I would say, undeniable and inspired a lot of art. Very good. <coughs> uh -huh. I do love Helen O'Connell, so I, I would never speak against her. <laughs> all I'm saying is, if data and technology and all of this medical skill is being used in the service of outdated norms, where are we going with it? We're still having so many problems that um, they should be solved by now, but they continue. Um, unfortunately, science has produced J. Marion Sims, Isaac Baker Brown, who was a big fan of clitoridectomies um, in the West, mm -hmm. Freud, as we talked about, and the contemporary Dr. Dix Pappas, who is uh, at Cornell Weill and performing surgeries on um, infants and children that can't consent to these surgeries, um, trying to create a binary normalcy for intersex children. Mm. So we need art. We need peaches. We need fuck the pain away. We need Lil' Kim, Queen Bitch. We need Hannah Wilk. We need Alice Walker's The Secret of Possessing Joy. We need The Dinner Party. Um, we must resist penialism. <laughs> and I'd like to show some of my art as part of my argument that I accidentally skipped past earlier. Um, a little bit of my work and then a lot of, um, oh, look, <laughs> we can imagine. 
It doesn't have to be the way that it is. Like, it could be different. Like, what would it feel like if this form was known and if this form existed in public space and it was just like one of the many symbols that we knew of and that we encountered? Um, you know, democracy without cliteracy, fallacy. <laughs> this is my mom's personal favorite law of cliteracy. Um, you know, clit rodeo. <laughs> My personal favorite. <laughs> it ain't gonna ride itself, you know? You put your hands right there and you ride it, you know? And uh, we bring, you know, bringing, bringing this, <laughs> and bring it back, right? Bring it back. Um, there was a lot of, that was a really, that was a fun time. We should do this again. Mm. This is my, my mother. Um, this is the first. Uh, altar that I made for the clitoris that I made in Mexico and she was helping me put flowers on the ground and this was really meaningful to me because both of her were raised Greek Orthodox in a tradition where um, you can only be a holy woman if you're a virgin and like the, your biggest goal in life is to be like the Virgin Mary who's like a virgin mother which of course you could never be so you always fail um, and there's always this sense of like anything that touches you makes you impure and then you're ruined forever. So it felt really meaningful to honor this part of the body with my mother. Uh, this is a neon that just says clitoris. <laughs> and it's in dialogue um, with contemporary artists, uh, our conceptual artist Bruce Nauman, and then Glenn Ligon, who did a piece after Bruce Nauman. Um, and I'm really just trying to kind of bring the subject matter into the discourse, elevate the clitoris and architectures so that we can imagine what it can be. Um, we can be move beyond our fear uh, of this thing um, and, and think about new possibilities of uh, existence that centralize the clitoris. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just gonna move rather quickly be just because we have a lot of content that we wanna cover and we also wanna hear from you guys and talk to you. Mm -hmm. So I just, I really fun. recommend writing it and sharing it and, and having joy with the clitoris. And oh, can I go to my other, I think I have some other slides too. Are they gone? Okay, I have a couple more slides, but I wanna show the other slides are just um, people who are doing work right now about the clitoris that are really just blowing my mind and making me excited. Um, I think part of what we start to feel when we see all of these images of like all like vulvas and pussies are grotesque and disgusting and embarrassing is that like I guess they're all they can't they can't be represented any other way mm -hmm. um, this is brand new me medical illustrations by uh, Alakina Man and I think they're super dope and interesting and beautiful and I've never seen anything that looks quite like that mm. um, these are illustrations by a Nigerian uh, medical student medical illustrator and he has a project called Some Babies Are Born Black. And his work is just absolutely beautiful. And I was astonished when I first saw it um, because I realized uh, my whole life I've been looking at images of, of Caucasian babies. And I didn't even realize that I was only looking at white babies and, and white vulvas and white bodies and how horrific and disgusting that is. So his work is really exciting um, and it's giving me hope. Um, this is a project called Mauj, and Mauj is uh, in the Arab world, and it was started um, basically to have conversations about um, sexuality and embodiment um, in Arabic uh, in a safe way for a lot of people who are not able to access information safely, speak openly. Um, and so they did a lot of really brilliant uh, strategies to get around censorship, such as collecting stories and then having other um, women read the stories. So all the stories are true, but no individual woman can be attacked for like, you said this, you called this person out, um, and you still have a real person and a real voice telling this real story. Um, and it was also really important in terms of talking to, to one of the people that was very involved with this project that um, the stories and the words were in Arabic um, and not coming through a, a Western voice or even, uh, you know, 
English, for example, where there's uh, you know an educational system that's directed in a particular way that like uh, hearing this information in one's mother tongue, you know, made all the difference. And it's a really powerful project, and I feel like it's disrupting misogyny globally in such a powerful way. Um, yeah, hell yeah. Um, okay, this is this incredible oh. beast who goes by clit worship, um, and she is making the most incredible... 3D animations, like CADs, printed things, um, they make them all go for a little while. I mean, she can do anything and everything, and she's, you know, she's an engineer by day, and she, like, does this on the side, and she's, like, absolutely incredible. She's amazing. Um, this is a project, Pussypedia, and this is a collaboration between a journalist and an illustrator, and, again, dealing with the fact that it's so hard to find access to not only accurate information, which is like a huge problem, but also from the subjectivity of our own selves, our own bodies, and, and a lack of shame. So everything about the way that this work is constructed, it's like, it's from the person touching their own body. The hand that's touching has an eye. It's looking at its, it, itself. It's looking at it um, back at the viewer. Um, this is some of the illustrator's work, uh, Maria Conejo. I mean, I think it's just so stunningly beautiful. And when I look at these symbols and I look at this, I mean, it's a line drawing and it's, it's so totally magical and it's like nothing that I've ever seen and just encountering it even for a moment changes how I think about myself and my own body. Um, this is an amazing French uh, dancer choreographer and this is his project. Um, I don't know that he thinks of these as clits, but to me, <laughs> Even better. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know, they're on the, the, bull, the Wall Street bull. I mean, I feel really hopeful about the future. Uh, these are medical students and activists who are protesting um, the horrific non-consensual surgeries that are being done on intersex babies. And I feel really hopeful about the future of medicine with all of these people that are changing um, changing the rules, questioning things, and, and saying we're not going to use these tools to reinforce these fucked up binaries and hierarchies. You know, <laughs> honestly, Sophia, listening to you and seeing these beautiful imaginations of what the world could look like, I feel like we're kind of saying the same thing. And maybe we should like have my people talk to your people and like do something together. Yeah, maybe we should team up and sort of combine yeah. our forces like Voltron. Maybe so an event like or something. Yeah, yeah totally. exactly. A team rocket we could be. Mm -hmm. We could wear those clit suits. Yeah. Okay, we'll noodle on this. This has been very productive. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> uh. So we're not going to ask you to decide who won because I think what it, oh, unless you want no, to. No, let's move to trivia. Yeah. Let's move to trivia. Let's go. <laughs> so I think we, yeah, I think we, the point of this was that we need each other. Um, we need both art and science and we need to work together to reimagine the body and to use the tools we both have for good and the authority we have in society. Um, and hopefully that came across because you're going to be tested on it right yes. now. <laughs> quiz. <laughs> it quiz, is a quiz, test. quiz. Okay, so we have a clitoracy challenge for you. How clitorate are you? And that's why you have your little whiteboards. Um, so you can keep your own score, but it's mostly for fun and to see how you're doing and come away with a fun fact to share with someone. Um, so this will be quick. Are you guys ready? Okay, great. You are ready. This one's Sophia's. <laughs> so. Okay, please complete the sentence. The earth is not the center of the universe. The blank is not the axis of sexuality. Yes, correct. <laughs> we just um, got a dick pic over oh, there. Oh, okay, <laughs> wow. Balance. Yay, oh my, nice. this is a really smart wow. audience. Okay, beautiful. Penis, great penis. They're so good. Can I, I really would Damn. like to see oh, pictures of Oh, I love that penis. This Uncircumcised for the win. Excellent. Yes. yes. Okay. We uh -oh. love all genitals. Did we here. make them not not hard enough? Okay, keep going. No, that's a great beginner. G good one. Okay, remember the clitoris has blank nerve endings and still isn't as sensitive as a white man on the internet. Ah. 
Oh wow. my gosh. They were listening. Yes. Okay. They actually got the specific number, 10,280, just to guess. Okay. okay. Wow. You guys are really hard. We're going to have some harder ones coming up. Here's an open-ended one. Yeah. It's a thinker. Yep. Ask. Oh yes, my God. I love yes, that one. Yes, 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 and yes. Y'all. Yes yes, yes. yes. Love it. Okay. You're all right. You okay. all get a point. See it. Ha, ha. Oh. oh my gosh, you guys are so smart. That's a really good one. Do you have the answer? We're gonna remember that. Um, no, we're I'm just telling them. The okay. Answer. Okay. So it's she, he, it's they, them, theirs. All those pronouns are the all the vowels. All yeah, those are all clip pronouns. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And more. Yes. How much of the clitoris is on the surface? Do you remember? Oh, you guys okay, are good. Okay, wow, this is a smart, Dang. we, I don't okay, know, we did wow. that. We should have, we underestimated, okay. <laughs> wow, we thought we were really, okay, you paid attention, you were awake, you guys. This is a higher level class that we, we had like AP click class. We usually yeah, have seriously. like the 101. Man, you guys knew the assignment. Okay, what is the false construct? Oh, did we, all of them? I, I think so, if you think about it. But I'm glad you said D, because that means that my point was hammered in. OK, this one, um, it is all of them. It is a trick question. You guys are, you guys are good. You nice. got us again. But I, I do want to really point out foreplay. Foreplay is a word, in my opinion, that we should just completely banish, because it's basically like everything that addresses the clit and is like somehow invalid, and then you get to the real thing. And it's like, it doesn't it's like OK, there's 10,000 nerves. If you stop touching the 10,000 nerves, then it's kind of like game over. Just like if you stop touching the 4,000 nerves of the penis and you just occasionally like bump um, up against it or hit it with your belly or something. Like All right, you got yours. Maybe, Let's move on. <laughs> yeah, the occasional, the occasional orgasm might happen, but most penises will probably not orgasm from like occasionally being bumped into. So basically, yeah. foreplay, let's like just completely get rid of it and basically if someone has a clitoris and you want them to, to orgasm then unless they're telling you don't touch my clit like be touching the clit obviously <laughs> right okay don't okay. take off <laughs> yeah and i just wanted to point out the g spot um, which is another name of something named after a guy um, a gynecologist named um grafenberg thank you Woo. um though it was named no it's not grafenberg Yeah. Wow. Wow. Who are we? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. But I'll add that it was named by a sexologist named Beverly Whipple, who thought about naming it Whipple's Tickle, <laughs> except there was already a Charmin commercial that included a Dr. Whipple. So, but you can use that. But I just wanted to point out that the G-spot, like, it's not like it's real or fake. It's that it was kind of presented to us as this myth, this magic button that if you push it, you'll have, like, this incredible orgasm. And uh, I realized that similar to the vaginal orgasm, it was this concept that told people that they were supposed to have a specific type of sexual experience. And if they didn't, they weren't having the full experience. They weren't a true woman. And that's the way in which both of them are a false construct, I would say. Basically, you can have pleasure through penetration that is clitoral. Mm -hmm. And you can have much more intense direct simulation of your clitoris from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, but there, it's still the clitoris. So, like, whether you get it from the inside or the I mean, it, it, like, it's all good. The point is that you have pleasure. Yes. But give credit where credit is due, mm. which is, like, the clit. Obviously. And I w just want to say boss. that the, the G spot is right here, actually. It's about an inch up on the belly side. And it's actually just the root of the clitoris. So just confirming Sophia's point. It's the root of the clitoris and some glands. Um, oh, we already have the next one. And people already have the answer. Yep. So what do these names have in common? C, C it's C yeah. mainly. Yeah. D yeah. is a good yeah. guess as well, but yeah. they all have the root of shame. OK. This is an important one. Heat and salt are to food as blank and blank are to the clit. Lube Very and great. love. Sorry. Fifty percent. Fifty percent right on that one. Fifty percent right. Yes. Yes. Contact I and like respect. that. I like I that. Love that. There's a lot of okay. These are a lot of good ones here. Touch um, my my answer is uh, vibrators and lube. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, you know, like, vibrators get a bad rap, but it's like, okay, yeah, um, it is natural to have your food raw, I guess, but I would prefer to have a lot of my food seared, sauteed, baked, boiled. If I'm having a fresh papaya, I would prefer to have it, like, fresh, but if I'm having a whole meal, I want some fresh, I want some cooked, I want some dessert, I want some flambe, I want all of it. And why would I ever have like the minimum of what I could have when I could, my capacity is like massive. And then in terms of lube, everything feels better when you have more lubrication, it feels great. It protects you from getting adhesions um, or, or scrapes. Um, and it's more sensitive. There's no, there should be no pressure to like prove that you can get naturally wet. I mean, just add more, like the same way that like, if you have a headache, you can take Advil. Mm. If you have a, you know, if you have a, an infection, you can take um, antibiotics. Like there's no need to not use the tools and resources that we have just because it has to do with pleasure. Oh, well, yeah, no, totally. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm with you. Um, yeah. Good. I'm, glad, I'm really glad to hear that. I think that some, in some spaces, people will try to discourage, and including in like um, the sexology community, they discourage people from using vibrators because they think that mm -hmm. there's a, there's an argument that it make it desensitizes you, or you should work okay. with you know yeah. what's natural and with your yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, yes, I'm with you. God invented vibrators for a reason. All right. This is the tricky one. This is for me. What year was the word clitoris used on network television? You have to write it in. I didn't even give you multiple choices. Okay, 1983. We have an 83 going once, going twice. 2012, not yet. That is grim. 2004, very good, very good. All right. Okay, 2004 is the closest, but oh, oh, 2000 um, is equally close. 2001 is even closer, so I, I think you get it, 2001. Um, you're going to get a prize later. So, um, so actually, it appeared on The Office, of all places, in 2002, but it was just in a passing joke. Um, the first time that it was actually defined and spoken by a woman was in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend in 2016, I want to say. i got to look this one up. I'm going to be real but Rachel Bloom was the person who went through the fights with network TV to get it used substantially in the episode To Josh With Love. I did remember that part, so. It's my favorite question. <laughs> what is the worst invention of all time? There's a lot to take in here, so take a moment. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, okay. I see three Bs over here, Sophia. They're, they, they've got Yep. It's a hard one, I know. <laughs> we really enjoyed finding that hair in a can photo. We got D <laughs> over here. It is terrible, I yes, admit. Yes, B, B. It's B. It's B. It's B. I don't know how you rate that, but I, I made the question and yes. I gave that uh, sorry. We are in charge, <laughs> so unfortunately, we're the opposite With of art, dictators. With art, you take a lot of liberties, so. Wait, they're all upset. Oh, oh, I thought you were saying awe. I was like, wait, what's so sad? <laughs> okay, yeah, which of these female body parts are named after a man? And you are all correct. Well done. You got that part of the, the test. Oh, no. The pouch of Douglas is a cul-de-sac between the vagina and anus, so it's internal. Fluid can end up there. And this guy, Douglas, I guess, was really into it and wanted his name to live forever in this random pouch that we don't know what it does, so... Good job, English gynecologist named Douglas. But it's open to renaming, uh, definitely. Okay, according to French philosopher Catherine Malibu, politically, the clitoris is a... Or an... Ooh. Yes. Whoa, the clitoris is an reading. anarchist. Okay. Fundamentally, and, and her theory around it is pretty incredible. Uh, and I'm not going to get into it now, but the, the book is out there on the, on the bookshelf and you can grab it and look at it and it's fantastic. What if it was a Republican though? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. Okay. Um, which body parts are composed of erectile tissue? The clitoris, the penis, the nasal septum, or the nipples? Ooh, interesting. Um, okay, we got mostly alls. 
The nipples are not composed of erectile tissue. The nipples have a different form of erecting, but the clitoris, penis, and nasal septum all engorge or fill with blood um, when they're aroused, except the nasal septum. <laughs> um, that's, like, <laughs> that's like when you're congested. Um, and so the a really interesting thing I learned researching this question was that for some people who take Viagra, they actually end up having very congested noses <laughs> because their nasal septum can swell up because it affects the same tissue and vice versa. They have trouble getting it up if they're taking anti-congestions. So good to know. Um, but yes, do remember that the clitoris is erectile, is powerful, dynamic, and makes beautiful shapes. That is all. Finally, <laughs> we're asking a lot out of you. So, you know, sometimes you might have heard in your life, you know, oh, like, suck my dick, bitch. And you're like, what should I say back? Say, oh, you can suck a fat clit. <laughs> suck a bag of clits. Or like, I was having a hard time figuring out what I was going to say in my debate, but then I grew a clit, and then I had like all my arguments, and I came up here. You grew that clit. Grow a clit. <laughs> Suck a fat clit energy. Very good. Yeah, very I like good. It. We love it. Yes. Suck a fat clit every, every day. day. We love that. Yes. Doctor's orders. <laughs> Grow a clit. Alternatively, such a fat clit, like in a good way. Oh, alternatively, suck a fat clip. Mm, yes, yes. <laughs> if you want an alternative. <laughs> Sorry, these goggles are not helping me see for some reason. <laughs> suck a fat clit, America. <laughs> yes, love that. Good advice. Oh, we love so the effort. I don't know. Do we have time for the last part, or should we, like, I think it'll, I think because we started late, it'll take five minutes. Do you guys want to do one little game, yeah. or do you want to go home? No, drinks, drinks. Not and no. drink, okay. I can make it real short. So um, something we've encountered, both of us in our work, is that you have a problem with language. Um, so vagina is used, including by doctors, incorrectly to mean all the wrong things and none of the right things. You have words that still mean shame that are in the medical lexicon. And you just have like bad words. Here's a little Venn diagram I came up with. You can take a second. Um, so, and I like kind of break it down into these Voldemort words. Like I literally can't say vagina. I have to say down there between the legs. It's like you're as vague as possible to avoid the actual thing you're talking about. And I had a colleague at Smithsonian who literally was taught to say front butt. And it's actually quite common, unfortunately. There was also a, no, I'll skip a minute. There was a vaginal microbiome like um, startup and they were saying like, clean your panty hamster on their trucks and advertisements. No. And like, you are a vaginal science. Yeah, no. You should be able to say what you're talking about and doing research on. How should I, how can I trust you? So as you can see, we need better words. And this is a bit of a challenge, I admit. Um, but we want to ask you for a little help um, in coming up with better words than history and the current day has, has given us. Um, in our fun brainstorming, we were trying to think of good words for masturbating, and I was looking at book titles, and I saw Waltzing the Cat, which I enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like Sophia's a lot, too. Can I mention that one? Sure, go ahead. It was uh, Scratching the Record, which we love. <laughs> I also, in a video about the clitoris, would call it My Dear Friend, and now Helen O'Connell calls it that as well, which we love. Oh, you're already one step ahead. Singing um, swan. Oh, so that's amazing. That is really, yeah. So if you want, feel free to take this kind of structure. Like, oh, hooded hero was a good one I saw when I was looking. But like the devil's teat, I honestly love. That's yeah. like, yeah. So if use this for inspiration, but suck don't a suck it. <laughs> yes. Someone write that down. <laughs> All right. So for your final challenge, we'd like you to have a minute to think about a word for your clit, something you'd like to call your own, something you'd like to have as a neutral word, or what you'd like to say when you masturbate if you don't want to say jerking off. Singing swan, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's so nice. Okay. Oh. Ah! 
DJ Clitty. DJ oh. Clitty in the house. DJ Clitty on the ones and twos. Yeah, mm. I love it. I love that. Uh, we had a flying free clitoris on the cover of my book, and we called it the Clitoridactyl, which I enjoyed. <laughs> Just throwing out ideas. Okay. Paradise Ooh, Express. Paradise yes. Express. Yes. I'm going to take some me time and have some go on Paradise Express. <laughs> Another book cover I saw that I wanted to use for my own clitoris was The Lost Shettle. <laughs> it's just like so deeply Jewish. <laughs> oh, this is a good one over here. Oh, yes. Double clicking the mouse. I love Double that. Click it. Happy Hill. That's, That's a really so good, good. Release the Kraken. You beat centuries. Going into orbit. These are really good. These are really good. Yeah, and if you guys didn't oh hear my Singing Swan for orgasm, I think that's gorgeous. And goes with the Shaking Swan series. Shaking my Shakira? Shaking my Shakira. Cluck <coughs> here. Shaking my chakra. Oh, man. Oh, shaking my chakra. And what was the bottom one beneath that? What was that? the other one? Rubbing my ruby. Rubbing yeah. my ruby. Yeah, I love it. Rubbing my ruby. My I like that. Is Rakira, I like the, so I the clitoris that. as a gem. I really like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Anyone else want to share? Do we have anyone? Okay. Keep keep thinking on it. Tag us if you think of more. Forgetting Freud. Oh my God, I I'm love that. I'm just gonna that. be in my bedroom forgetting Freud. Yes. <laughs> so I just good. don't think of his name. When yes. I'm and going into orbit. I just want to make sure going I said into that, orbit. that one. Is, I really okay. like that one as well. Please um, tweet those at us or tag us on Instagram because we would love to talk about them. And we won't make you do this, but one thing that we thought would be really fun. <laughs> Was it the clit had a tagline? What would it be? I really want tote bags to say the pleasure is all mine with Sophia's like cut out clit on it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well we have an audience, so. Um, but. Yeah, but I think we just, we really want to say thank you guys so much for coming and staying and having fun with us. Yeah. Putting yourselves out there. Listening us. Oh, thank you, thank you. And, uh, we have one more really fun fact for you, which is that Jen from the Green Space has been counting the numbers of times we've said clit and clitoris, <laughs> because as far as we know, this is the first event dedicated to the clitoris and the most times that it's been said on stage at the Green Space. And what's the final count, Jen? 123. 123, <laughs> congratulate yourselves. So, so you just made clit history. Yeah. yeah. Calistery, thank oh, you. Yeah, what do you want to? I have a question. What about how media portrays orgasm like the movie? Oh, so much to say. <laughs> what about it? You yes. My, my friend Jordane yeah. Searles has an essay on um, how there's all these, like, immediately you get penetrated and you're like, oh! Like, yeah, and like how that's been changing for the better in certain films. And she points out films where it's done really nuanced in a really good way, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it just follows all the same tropes that we've been talking about, where like if you think the penis is a wand of pleasure and you're really thinking about how men think women get off in some fantasy land vacuum, then there's the fantasy on screen. Um, it's messed up, definitely. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that sent me in a rage spiral where I started working on this project because I just, you know, I'm trained as a photographer formerly in my background and all the depictions of sex and sexuality, I never saw anyone touch a clit. And I saw all these orgasms, supposedly, and I was like, this is just absurd, and why aren't we calling bullshit on this? Like, it's, it's hilarious, but it's actually devastating. Um, and it's even in, in, like, lesbian, you know, in the L word, like, you'll have, like, strap-on sex, and you'll have all this penetration, and, like, nobody's touching a clit. Look at, like, any, like, oh, 25 amazing sex positions, and there's no one touching a clit. And you're like, there, I mean, there, Amazing well, for, whom? for whom? For uh, whom? Right. So I, I think um, I think we should laugh at the hubris and the ridiculousness of that, uh, and and also obviously you know make better media. But but exact exactly. I mean it's, and I think it's one of those situations where things are getting worse at the same time as they're getting better because. We have mainstream porn, which is like reifying the idea that like more aggressive penetration and someone screaming and shrieking is the same as them having pleasure. And then you also have like ethically produced queer and feminist porn that is having like actual real orgasms with, for people with clits. And you have like trans people and people with disabilities and various things. So both of these things are happening at the same time, but it's, it's, it's why it's so radical 
that the green space is holding space for this because there have never been this many clits in this building ever, <laughs> ever. Yes. And we're saying it and we're showing it and they're in the windows. And, and it uh, is extremely rare to ever encounter this in one's like public life. So I really thank the green space so much for having us. Thank you so much. And all of you. Thank you all. And keep asking those questions. That's how we move forward. You can touch this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Come have a drink with us. Explore the shrine. Thank you so much. <laughs>